Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. There would be a price, and it would not be small. Draco had known that as soon as he'd woken up and realized that he didn't dare enter the Great Hall for breakfast because he might see Harry Potter there, and Draco didn't know what would happen after that. Footsteps approached. The churning in Draco's stomach got worse. Harry Potter came into sight. His face was carefully neutral, but his blue-trimmed robes looked oddly askew, as if they hadn't been put on quite right. Your hand! Madame Pomfrey said it's not permanent. She said it should mostly recover by the time classes start tomorrow. For an instant, the news came as a relief. And then Draco realized. You went to Madame Pomfrey. Of course I did. My hand wasn't working. It was slowly dawning on Draco what an absolute fool he'd been, far worse than the older Slytherins he'd chewed out. He'd just taken for granted that no one would go to the authorities when a Malfoy did something to them that no one would want Lucius Malfoy's eye on them, ever. But Harry Potter wasn't a frightened little Hufflepuff trying to stay out of the game. He was already playing it, and Father's eye was already on him. What else did Madame Pomfrey say? Professor Flitwig said that the spell cast on my hand had been a dark torture hex and extremely serious business, and that refusing to say who did it was absolutely unacceptable. I apologized deeply, which made Professor Flitwick look very stern, and then I told Professor Flitwick that the whole thing was, indeed, extremely serious, secret, delicate business, and that I'd already informed the headmaster about the project. No! Flitwick isn't going to just accept that! He'll check with Dumbledore! Indeed! I was promptly hauled off to the headmaster's office. Draco was trembling now. If Dumbledore brought Harry Potter before the Wizengamot, willingly or otherwise, and had the boy who lived testify under Veritaserum that Draco had tortured him, too many people loved Harry Potter, Father could lose that vote. Father might be able to convince Dumbledore not to do that, but it would cost. Dumbledore deduced immediately that it was you. He knew we'd been associating. We had a chat, and I explained that it would be in his best interest not to do anything. After which... The headmaster told Professor Flitwick that this was, indeed, a secret and delicate matter of which he had already been informed, and that he did not think pressing it at this time would help me or anyone. Professor Flitwick started to say something about the headmaster's usual plotting going much too far, and I had to interrupt at that point and explain that it had been my own idea and not anything the headmaster had forced me into. So Professor Flitwick spun around and started lecturing me, and the headmaster interrupted him and said that as the boy who lived, I was doomed to have weird and dangerous adventures, so I was safer if I got into them on purpose instead of waiting for them to happen by accident. And that was when Professor Flitwick threw up his little hands and started shrieking in a high-pitched voice at both of us, about how he didn't care what we were cooking up together, but this wasn't ever to happen again for as long as I was in Ravenclaw House, or he would have me thrown out and I could go to Gryffindor, which was where all this Dumbledoring belonged. Anyway, I didn't want to be thrown out of Ravenclaw, so I promised Professor Flitwick that nothing like this would happen again, and if it did, I would just tell him who did it. Harry's eyes should have been cold. They weren't. 
The voice should have made it a deadly threat. It wasn't. And Draco saw the question that should have been obvious, and it killed the mood in an instant. Why... didn't you? Why didn't I? I guess because I just couldn't get angry at you. I knew I'd hurt you first. I won't even call it fair, because what I did to you was worse than what you did to me. Harry could have been speaking archaic Greek for all Draco understood him then. The statement was a concession that hadn't been in Harry's best interests. It wasn't even what Harry should say to make Draco a more loyal servant now that Harry held power over him. For that, Harry should be emphasizing how kindly he'd been, not how much he'd hurt Draco. Even so, please don't do that again, Draco. It hurt, and I'm not sure I could forgive you a second time. I'm not sure I'd be able to want to. Draco just didn't get it. Was Harry trying to be friends with him? There was no way Harry Potter could be dumb enough to believe that was still possible after what he'd done. You could be someone's friend and ally, like Draco had tried to do with Harry. Or you could destroy their life and leave them no other options. Not both. But then, Draco didn't understand what else Harry could be trying. And a strange thought came to Draco, something Harry had kept talking about yesterday. And the thought was... Test it. You're awakening as a scientist now, and even if you never learn to use your power, you'll always <gasps> be looking for ways to test your beliefs. Those ominous words, spoken in gasps of agony, had kept running through Draco's mind. If Harry was pretending to be the repentant friend who had accidentally hurt someone... You planned what you did to me. You didn't do it because you got angry. You did it because you wanted to. Fool, Harry Potter would say. Of course I planned it, and now you're mine. What happened yesterday wasn't the plan. The plan was that I would teach you why you were always better off knowing the truth, and then we would try together to discover the truth about blood, and whatever the answer was, we would accept it. Yesterday I... rushed things. Always better off knowing the truth. Like you did me a favor. What if Lucius comes up with the same idea I did, that the problem is stronger wizards having fewer children? He might start a program to pay the strongest purebloods to have more children. In fact, if blood purism were right, that's just what Lucia should be doing, addressing the problem on his side, where he can make things happen right away. Right now, Draco, you're the only friend Lucius has who would try to stop him from wasting the effort, because you're the only one who knows the real truth and can predict the real results. The thought came to Draco that Harry Potter had been raised in a place so strange that he was now effectively a magical creature rather than a wizard. Draco simply couldn't guess what Harry would say or do next. Why? Why did you do this to me? What was your plan? Well, you're Lucius's heir, and believe it or not, Dumbledore thinks I belong to him. So we could grow up and fight their battles with each other. Or we could do something else. You want to provoke a fight to the finish between them, then seize power after they're both exhausted? Stars above, no! You wouldn't go along with that, and neither would I. This is our world, we don't want to break it. But imagine, say, Lucius thought the conspiracy was your tool and you were on his side. Dumbledore thought the conspiracy was my tool and I was on his side. Lucius thought that you turned me and Dumbledore believed the conspiracy was mine. Dumbledore thought that I'd turned you and Lucius believed the conspiracy was yours. And so they both helped us out, but only in ways that the other one wouldn't notice. Draco did not have to fake being speechless. Father had once taken him to see a play called The Tragedy of Light, about this incredibly clever Slytherin named Light, who'd set out to purify the world of evil using an ancient ring that could kill anyone whose name and face he knew and who'd been opposed by another incredibly clever Slytherin, a villain named Lalit, who'd worn a disguise to conceal his true face. And Draco had shouted and cheered at all the right parts, especially in the middle. And then the play had ended sadly, and Draco had been hugely disappointed. And Father had gently pointed out that the word tragedy was right there in the title. Afterward, Father had asked Draco if he understood why they had gone to see this play. Draco had said it was to teach him to be as cunning as Light and Lalit when he grew up. Father had said that Draco couldn't possibly be more wrong, and pointed out that while Lalit had cleverly concealed his face, there had been no good reason for him to tell Light his name. Father had then gone on to demolish almost every part of the play, while Draco listened with his eyes growing wider and wider. And Father had finished by saying that plays like this were always unrealistic, because if the playwright had known what someone actually as smart as Light would actually do, 
the playwright would have tried to take over the world himself instead of just writing plays about it. That was when Father had told Draco about the Rule of Three, which was that any plot which required more than three different things to happen would never work in real life. Father had further explained that since only a fool would attempt a plot that was as complicated as possible, the real limit was two. Draco couldn't even find the words to describe the sheer, gargantuan unworkability of Harry's master plan. But it was just the sort of mistake you would make if you didn't have any mentors and you thought you were clever and had learned about plotting by watching plays. So, what do you think of the plan? It's clever. Shouting, Brilliant! and gasping in awe would have looked too suspicious. Harry, can I ask a question? Why did you buy Granger an expensive pouch? To show no hard feelings, though I expect she'll also feel awkward if she refuses any smaller quests I make over the next couple of months. And that was when Draco realized that Harry actually was trying to be his friend. Harry's move against Granger had been smart, maybe even brilliant. Make your enemy not suspect you and put them in your debt in a friendly way so that you could maneuver them into position just by asking them. Draco couldn't have gotten away with that. His target would have been too suspicious. But the boy who lived could. If you were Harry's enemy, his plans might be hard to see through at first. They might even be stupid. But his reasoning would make sense once you understood it. The way Harry was acting toward Draco right now did not make sense. Because if you were Harry's friend, then he tried to be friends with you in the alien, incomprehensible way he'd been raised by muggles to do, even if it meant destroying your entire life. I know that I've abused our friendship terribly, but please realize, Draco, that in the end, I just wanted the two of us to find the truth together. Is that something you can forgive? A fork with two paths, but with only one path easy to go back on later if Draco changed his mind. I guess I understand what you are trying to do, so yes. I'm glad to hear that, Draco. And Draco realized with a note of horror and despair that although it was a terrifying fate indeed to be Harry's friend, Harry now had so many different avenues for threatening Draco that being his enemy would be even worse. Probably. Maybe. Well, he could always switch to being enemies later. He was doomed. Oh, and before you go, I know this is a bad time, but I wanted to ask you for advice about something, actually. Buying that pouch for Granger used up most of the gold I managed to steal from my Gringotts vault. And McGonagall has the vault key, or Dumbledore does now, maybe. And I was just about to launch a plot that might take some money, so I was wondering if you know how I can get access... I'll loan you the money. Draco, you don't have to. How much? Harry named the amount, and Draco couldn't quite keep the shock from showing on his face. That was almost all the spending money Father had given Draco to last out the whole year. Draco would be left with just a few galleons. Then, Draco mentally kicked himself. All he had to do was write Father and explain that the money was gone because he'd managed to loan it to Harry Potter. And Father would send him a special congratulatory note written in golden ink, a giant chocolate frog that would take two weeks to eat, and ten times as many galleons just in case Harry Potter needed another loan. It's way too much, isn't it? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked. Excuse me, I am a Malfoy, you know. I was just surprised you wanted that much. Don't worry. It's nothing that threatens your family's interests, just me being evil. No problem then. You want to go get it right now? Sure. So, can you tell me which plot this is for? Rita Skeeter. Draco thought some very bad words to himself, but it was far too late to say no. By the time they'd reached the dungeons, Draco had started pulling together his thoughts again. He was having trouble hating Harry Potter. Harry had been trying to be friendly, he was just insane. And that wasn't going to stop Draco's revenge or even slow it down. So, I've been thinking, when we bring new recruits into the conspiracy, they're going to have to think we're equals. Otherwise, it would only take one of them to blow the plot to father. You already worked that out, right? Naturally. Will we be equals? I'm afraid not. I'm sorry, Draco, but you don't even know what the word Bayesian in Bayesian Conspiracy means right now. You're going to have to study for months before we take anyone else in, just so you can put up a good front. Because I don't know enough science. The problem isn't that you're ignorant of specific science things like deoxyribose nucleic acid. That wouldn't stop you from being my equal. The problem is that you aren't trained in the methods of rationality. The deeper, secret knowledge behind how all these discoveries got made in the first place. 
I'll try to teach you those, but they're a lot harder to learn. Think what we did yesterday, Draco. Yes, you did some of the work, but I was the only one in control. You answered some of the questions. I asked all of them. You helped push. I did the steering by myself. And without the methods of rationality, Draco, you can't possibly steer the conspiracy where it needs to go. I see. I'll try to respect your expertise, Draco, about things like people stuff. But you need to respect my expertise too, and there's just no way you could be my equal when it comes to steering the conspiracy. You've only been a scientist for one day. You know one secret about deoxyribose nucleic acid, and you aren't trained in any of the methods of rationality. I understand. And he did. People stuff, Harry had said. Seizing control of the conspiracy probably wouldn't even be difficult. And afterward, he would kill Harry Potter just to be sure. The memory rose up in Draco of how sick inside it had felt last night, knowing Harry was screaming. Draco thought some more bad words. Fine, he wouldn't kill Harry. Harry had been raised by muggles. It wasn't his fault he was insane. Instead, Harry would live on. Just so Draco could tell him that it had all been for Harry's own good. Really, he ought to be grateful. And with a sudden twitch of surprised pleasure, Draco realized that it actually was for Harry's own good. If Harry tried to carry out his plan of playing Dumbledore and Father for Fools, he would die. That made it perfect. Draco would take all of Harry's dreams away from him, just as Harry had done to him. Draco would tell Harry that it had been for his own good, and it would be absolutely true. Draco would wield the conspiracy and the power of science to purify the wizarding world, and Father would be as proud of him as if he'd been a Death Eater. Harry's evil plots would be foiled, and the forces of right would prevail. The perfect revenge. Unless... Unless all that was exactly what Harry wanted Draco to do as part of some even larger plot, which Draco would play right into by trying to foil this one. Harry might even know that his plan was unworkable. It might have no purpose except luring Draco to thwart it. No, that way lay madness. There had to be a limit. The Dark Lord himself hadn't been that twisty. That sort of thing didn't happen in real life, only in Father's silly bedtime stories about foolish gargoyles who always ended up furthering the hero's plans every time they tried to stop him. And beside Draco, Harry walked along with a smile on his face, thinking about the evolutionary origins of human intelligence. 20% of a human's metabolic energy went into feeding the brain. Humans were ridiculously smarter than any other species. Ending up with that gigantic, outsized brain must have taken some sort of runaway evolutionary process. Something that would push and push without limits. And today's scientists had a pretty good guess at what that runaway evolutionary process had been. Harry had once read a famous book called Chimpanzee Politics. The book had described how an adult chimpanzee named Lut had confronted the aging alpha, Yorin, with the help of a young, recently matured chimpanzee named Nikki. Nikki had not intervened directly in the fights between Lut and Yorin, but had prevented Yorin's other supporters in the tribe from coming to his aid, distracting them when every confrontation developed between Lut and Yorin. And in time, Lut had won and become the new Alpha, with Nikki as the second most powerful. Though it hadn't taken very long after that for Nikki to form an alliance with the defeated Yorin, overthrow Lut, and become the new new Alpha. It really made you appreciate what millions of years of hominids trying to outwit each other an evolutionary arms race without limit had led to in the way of increased mental capacity. Cause, you know, a human would have totally seen that one coming. And beside Harry, Draco walked along, suppressing his smile as he thought about his revenge. Some day, maybe in years, but some day, Harry Potter would learn just what it meant to underestimate a Malfoy. Draco had awakened as a scientist in a single day. Harry had said that wasn't supposed to happen for months. But of course, if you were a Malfoy, you would be a more powerful scientist than anyone who wasn't. So Draco would learn all of Harry Potter's methods of rationality, and then when the time was ripe...